I had the wonderful privilege of spending the summer of 2002 in Jordan on an archaeological dig. And it was a dream come true. I was out one day on an ancient site called Tel Jalul, where Andrews University is leading the dig. And I was out walking the tell, looking for broken pieces of pottery. They're called pottery sherds. I'd ridden out there with a friend, Dick, and he had gone over to see someone he knew, and I'd spent about two hours looking for treasure, and um, my, my wife didn't think it was that great a treasure when I brought it home, but uh, it was treasure. And after being there about two hours, I saw someone drive up on the road down at the bottom of the tell. He got out and started walking up the tell. I didn't re recognize him, did not recognize the car. It was not Dick. And so he came up to me and said in a broken English Arab accent, Mr. Dick sent me. Okay, well, they knew I came out with Dick, Mr. Dick. And so I figured that they must be friendly. And so um, I thought about it just a second and got in the car and we went over to where Dick was visiting this uh, Muslim Arab family at their home. Now, I did not expect to go over there. I was wearing shorts and um, shorts are not the kind of, uh, of uh, clothing you might wear in a traditional Arab Muslim home. But there I was. I felt a little bit awkward. But the, the host was uh, very gracious. He welcomed me in. And in honor of Dick being there, they were having a banquet. And they were having the Jordanian national dish. It's called mansef. Now, it's very impressive looking. <clears throat> it's a communal meal. And so it, it's served on a large platter, very large platter. And it's served with a base of rice. And interspersed in the base of rice were chunks of um, goat meat and chunks of, of sheep and sprinkled around were also roasted broccoli and roasted cauliflower over the top to make it nice and nice and rich was a very thick broth or a, a, a gravy of uh, lamb gravy and then right in the middle of the big bed of rice was a roasted goat head, uh, complete with the tongue hanging out askew over to the side and the eyes still in place. And the rule of thumb was the eyes are for the guest of honor and I have never been so glad that I was not the guest of honor. So I, um, I try to practice vegetarianism or veganism these days, but as a guest in this home, I ate around the edges and, and uh, survived, and um, it was okay. The, the other interesting thing for Americans is that it's a communal meal, and they don't give you uh, disposable paper plates and paper or plastic forks. It is, as I say, a communal meal, so everyone uses their right hand and reaches in, gets a ball of the rice, squeezes it together, and then eats it like this. And then the, the hand would go, after having fed yourself, go back in for another bite. Uh, Americans had a little bit of a hard time with that. I don't know if they can eat this way during the COVID crisis over there. I have no idea. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, it was an interesting thing. And we were all guests at this home. Now, I tell you this story because this is the mental picture that I have in my brain when I read Luke chapter 14, verse 16. We're going to look at a parable today in Luke 14, starting with verse 16. 
Luke uh, 14 has a number of parables in it. In Luke chapter 14, verse 16, it says this. Luke 14, 16. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. Now this is the same, same story that's told in Matthew 22. But I kind of like the way it's told in, Matthew, or in Luke chapter 14. So it's a story about a great feast. And when I think about this story, I think about being in this Arab man's home and this manseph. And it's interesting, <clears throat> in Greek, it said a man once gave a mega banquet. So this is a mega feast. This is not just a feast. This is a mega feast. And so what did he do? He invited all kinds of people. Now, this feast that Jesus is talking about is referred to back in Isaiah. It's the same idea back in Isaiah 25, verse 6. So I think Jesus is using this imagery. <clears throat> Matthew 25, verse 6. Isaiah prophesies, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all of his peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, and of aged wine well refined. So Isaiah prophesies that there will be this great, great feast, and Jesus is picking up that imagery, and he's telling this parable. He says, a, one, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. Now, as I say, this is a parable that's paralleled in Matthew 22. Although the details are a little different in Matthew 22. In Matthew 22, it's a wedding feast, and here it's just called a, a great feast. And some people have, have uh, used the differences in the Matthew 22 parable and the Luke 14 parable They've used the differences to try to prove that the Bible doesn't know what it's talking about. They've tried to use the differences to say, well, which is it, a wedding feast or a great feast? What they don't understand is that, you know, Jesus traveled many places for three and a half years. He must have told these parables in many places at many times. And if you look at the setting in the books of Matthew and Luke, you find out that the setting is very different and so I think that you have basically the same parable told in two different places. And so the critics are just simply wrong. They, they don't know what they're saying. And so Matthew, or Luke rather, 14, 16, it says, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. So the custom of the day was this. <clears throat> Remember, you're talking about a, a day before microwaves, and good, reliable stoves powered by electricity or gas. And so what the custom was, was that you would invite your guests, you would tell them the feast is going to be this day. So they would put it on their calendar. They would RSVP, say they're coming, but they, the, the, the time was not given for when the feast would happen, exact timing. And so on the, on the morning of the feast, uh, the people who were making the feast would determine what time it would be ready. Servants would be sent out to all the people that had been invited. Of course, they were all probably right in that area because of the transportation. And so people would be sent out, uh, uh, slaves would be sent out, and people would be invited. Come now, the feast is ready. So verse 17, it says, At the time for the banquet... He sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. So the banquet is ready. The great feast is ready. All it needs is guests. All it needs is for people who will participate. Come, for everything is now ready. <clears throat> and then something remarkable happens. And at that, let's see, verse uh, 18. 
And they all alike began to make excuses. You know, I remember many times when our children were invited to parties. They'd wake up that morning knowing the party was going to happen. And they'd say, when are we leaving? When's the party? When are we leaving? They're so eager and anxious. But that's not these people. They began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go and see it. Please have me excused. Now, when you look at this excuse, it is a non-excuse. I just find it difficult to think that someone bought a field and hadn't looked at it in advance. Not only to see, if, see what it was worth, so he'd know a, a good price, but see if it was fertile, all kinds of things. And so I have bought a field. I need to go and see it. Please have me excused. The next one says, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. Really? You bought 10 oxen, and you haven't tested them? You haven't seen them? You haven't seen if they're skinny, if they're fat, if they're strong, if they're weak, if they're old, or if they're young bulls? This excuse, again, makes absolutely no sense. Even if it were legitimate, couldn't you go tomorrow? I mean, it's time for a party. The third man, <clears throat> verse 20. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore cannot come. Well, this one may be somewhat legitimate. Uh, there was a law in the Old Testament, uh, Deuteronomy 24, 5, that gave a, a, a man an excuse not to go to work for one year, a, a year-long honeymoon. So, I mean, you know, this could have been a legitimate excuse, but if you got a new bride, wouldn't you want to go show her off? Wouldn't you want to go, go show her a good time at someone else's expense? And so even this one doesn't make sense. And besides that, he had already accepted the invitation, as had the other two guys. They had already accepted the invitation. He knew he was getting married. He had accepted the invitation, and now he backs out. Excuses, excuses, excuses. Whether legitimate or not, they did, doesn't really matter because all three sound lame to me. Now, understand, they're not out doing evil things. They're taking care of life. One old writer, one old preacher said, um, you can excuse your way, you can excuse your way to hell, but you can't excuse your way to heaven. Because excuses don't work. And Here's another strange thing about the story. All of these had been invited and had, re had accepted. And don't you think it would have been a joy to go banquet with the master? Don't you think that would have been a joy? Because think about who these people are. These people are the kind of people that you want at your banquet. These were the banquet giver's friends. These weren't strangers. These are the ones that when you make a guest list, you want to invite. These were the highest on his guest list. And evidently, they rated high on his list, but he rated low on theirs. Perhaps you've had that experience where you kind of thought somebody was a good friend, and then they fi you find out they're really not. You, just to put it bluntly, you find out that you like them better than they like you. It's kind of a sad thing, kind of disappointing. Have you ever had this happen? I, I, I have. 
I've seen it happen. A few years ago when my wife and I were uh, just home for Thanksgiving, the kids weren't coming home and see, we were just going to be home. And so we hated to have Thanksgiving alone. And we thought of some people who would also be having Thanksgiving alone. And so we invited them over. <clears throat> they accepted. We bought the food. My wife made the plans. My wife cooked the food. You're getting what I said there, right? My wife cooked the food, had about half of it ready on Wednesday night. Then Wednesday evening, they called and says, they say, oh, sorry, we can't come. And it turns out they had been invited somewhere else. And they prioritized that invitation over our invitation. Why? I don't, I have no idea. But I thought it was rude. So here it is. It's D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody said, you can excuse yourself to hell, but you cannot excuse yourself to heaven. That's an interesting parable. Now, historically, Jesus is telling this to the Jews. And so if you wanted to know the exact local application of this parable, it's applied to the Jews. The Jews have been, have been invited to the wedding feast or to the, 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 the great feast of, of God. And even though they have been invited, they have not accepted it. They have made excuses. That's what Jesus is saying. And so the local application is specifically to the Jews for rejecting Jesus. So what will happen? We're kind of still in the middle of the, uh, still in the, middle of the parable. All the food's ready. What's going to happen? Verse number 21. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, he, he became angry. Do you blame him? I don't blame him. He became angry and said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. This is an interesting way to fill the church. Some Sabbath morning, Rick, let's get a bunch of sawhorses, go out on 29, block the highway off, put some arrows and compel people to come into the Atherton church. I like the idea. Oh, by the way, we'll also be full of lame people and blind people and, and all these other people. It, it works, but that's what happened in the parable. And so finally, the house was filled. The house is filled. But look who it's filled with. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, maybe not the good, because there was only one who was good, and that was the master of the house. That's the symbol of God, of course. But of all the ones that came in to the banquet were the bad and the ugly. Now, next week, we're going to look at the other half of this parable. We're going to go back to Matthew 22 and see the second half of the parable because they're, parable, they're, they're parallel passages. And so next week will tell us the fact that they were all bad and ugly. But we'll get there next week. But that's who was there. The, the, the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Who are they? Especially the ones that have been compelled off the highway these are people who are traveling in traveling clothes. 
These are people who had not intended to go to a banquet. They're probably dressed in their worst, not their best. And yet they are invited into the great feast. They are strangers, the bad and the ugly. Do they deserve to be there? No. They have no relationship with the master. Did they expect to be there? No. They're surprised to be there. They might not even have known the great banquet was happening. They might have. They did not know that the banquet was happening, and they did not expect to be there. Did they have any reason to be mad, angry, because they weren't invited? No, they didn't. I have to admit to you <clears throat> that I was not angry when I did not receive a, an invitation many years ago to the um, wedding of Princess Di and, and Prince Charles. I was not angry about that. I had no reason to expect to go. I, didn't, I was not angry when, when um, I didn't receive an invitation to go to the wedding of Michael Jackson and Lisa Marie Presley. I, we all knew it wasn't going to last anyway, so why go, right? <clears throat> no, I had no expectation to be there. I had no reason to think that I should be there. These people had no reason to expect the invitation, and yet they accepted the invitation, and they had a great time. And this is why this is a parable of God's grace. God's grace. God's grace is given to those who don't deserve it. God's grace is given to those who don't deserve it but are willing to accept it. That's the only requirement to, to, about God's grace is we have to be willing to accept it. And it's interesting that the invited guests did not accept it, which says something about their relationship with the, with the feast giver. Grace is getting from God that which we don't deserve. Grace is God accepting me, the unacceptable. I have, I have lived my life in such a way that I do not deserve to be in the kingdom of God. But because he loves me, he extends to me his grace. He has promised me eternal life, and he's promised it to you. I, I, I started to subtitle this sermon, Graceville for Adults. Pastor Anastasia and the children's ministries team are creating Graceville, and they're going to create Graceville in our hall downstairs. And you've seen our Graceville videos. Well, this is Graceville for Adults. All adults are invited because Graceville is where God's love is everywhere. And it's not just for children. It's for us as an adult. And if there were a bunch more people here, I would have loved to have heard about 10 amens. <laughs> there we go. I got one. You know, some people say that God is not fair, and I am so glad he's not fair. If God were fair, you would be cooked. You would be toast. I would be toast. God is not fair. He is filled with grace. He accepts us with grace. I have to admit that the word grace is not a word I heard a lot as a child growing up in my little home church. It wasn't a common topic, but it was something that I learned. And I'm not sure how I learned it, but I I learned it. I learned it from my mother, I think. I saw a, um, <clears throat> a meme on Facebook this week. I took a picture of it and put it on here just because I wanted to read it to you. Someone posted this. It says, unfortunately, no one notices your tears. No one notices your sadness. No one notices your pain, but everyone notices your mistakes. 
But that's not true with the grace of God. As a matter of fact, that may be true with brothers and sisters, although with, with people, I hope it's not true of brothers and sisters in the church. But I know it's true of the feast giver. I know it's true of of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I know it's true of God because he offers us grace. As a matter of fact, he does notice your tears. As a matter of fact, he does notice your sadness. He does notice your pain. And he loves you so much that when he sees your mistakes, he's willing to forgive them and forget them. That's grace. There's a song written and sung by a, a singer named Rich Mullins that says, uh, there's a wideness in God's mercy that I cannot find in my own. It's a goal for us. But God offers us grace. Shouldn't we offer each other grace? So think of those that came to the feast, poor crippled, blind, lame. That's you. That's me. That's our condition without Jesus, without the grace of God. That's our condition. We have no reason to expect. These people are the ones that usually don't get invited to a feast. And isn't that a shame? The parable right before this in Luke 14, there's not time to go to that one, but there's, there's another parable that talks about when you give a feast, these are the people you should invite because if you invite your friends, they can invite you back and it's like quid quo pro. It's kind of like you scratch my back, I scratch yours. You, you be nice to me, I'll be nice to you. What about those people? Well, they're, we're not going to invite them. These are the people that Jesus says, we should invite. And it's probably a good thing the original invitees were not there because, let's be honest, they would have been very uncomfortable with these people. They might not have wanted to be at a party with them because, let's be honest, they probably didn't smell as good as they might have. They were traveling on the streets. They weren't dressed nice, that's for sure. But these are the ones who responded. The rich, the elite, the self-sufficient could throw their own party. They didn't have to come to God's. They were self-sufficient. These people who were invited that did not come, Revelation calls them Laodiceans. They're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And they don't realize that they're poor, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. But the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame and the, the street goers, they are wowed by the generosity of the banquet giver. This is probably the best party they will ever attend. They look like the poorest candidates for the banquet, for church, or for the kingdom of heaven. But these are the ones that get it because of the pure grace of God. And so on, on this other level, on this experiential, this personal level, level, this is where we come into the parable. This is because the Jews rejected Jesus the kingdom was offered to another people, the Gentiles. This is where I fall in. I don't have Jewish blood in me. I'm a Gentile. Now, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to insinuate that because the Jews rejected the gospel, <clears throat> then we got to go in. No, 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 no. See, the Jews didn't understand that it was God's plan from the beginning to use the Jews to reach the world. It was God's plan originally that the Jewish nation would evangelize the world and the whole world would be saved. See, it wasn't like an either or. God wanted to use the Jewish nation, but because the Jewish nation rejected him, then he had to turn to another people. And that's why he, 
He created the church. That's why, that's why it's our responsibility as a church to reach out to those people, those, those poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. It's our job to invite them to the banquet, to the wedding feast, to the lamb. It's our responsibility to share that with them. Will we? Will we realize our place? There are many parallels between the chosen people of God, the Jews in Jesus' day, and the Seventh-day Adventist church today. Sister White talks about them. We are the chosen remnant of the SDA church, the chosen, prophetic, destined people who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. And we are invited to spread the good news about the great feast. What excuses are you giving not to accept the invitation of Jesus every day? The invitation of Jesus to spend more time with him. The invitation to, to draw closer to him through Bible study and prayer. The invitation to share the good news about the, about the wedding feast. What, are your, what do your excuses say about your relationship with the banquet giver? <clears throat> you know, the book of Luke 32 times talks about feasting and banqueting. In the next chapter, Luke 15, and we're going to preach our way through a number of parables of grace in the next few weeks, the three pastors together. And the next chapter after Luke 14 has three parables, and the end of all three parables is a party. It's a party. There are some people that are offended by the, by the idea that the coming of the kingdom of heaven, the great culmination of all things as described as a party. There are some people who think it seems frivolous. There are some who, who are very sober-minded to think it, who, who think that it's too light. There are some who want to see the Christian life as a battle. And for them, it's hard to think about the kingdom of heaven being a party. But what else is God going to do when he has all the kids home? He's going to throw a party. It's going to be the greatest feast of all time. He's going to throw a party. What can the father possibly do but celebrate? The invitation is for all. It's for all of us to accept. One of my favorite pictures is a picture of a long table. We actually saw it earlier in, this, in the PowerPoint. <clears throat> it's a long table. It looks like it goes on forever and ever. It's, it's the perspective of the picture is wonderful. And we, we have one at our home. And at the bottom of the picture, it says, come for all things are now ready. I shouldn't expect to be there. You have no right to be there. You have no claim to be there. You can't tell God how many years you have been in the church, how many times you've studied, the, read the Bible through. You can't tell God how many times, this was for many years ago, how many times you collected your ingathering goals. You can't tell God all the wonderful works you've done. I don't care what you've done. You don't deserve to be there, and I don't deserve to be there. But it's through the sheer, unadulterated, wonderful grace of God that he invites us to be there. And I plan to be there. Furthermore, I plan to stay for dessert. I plan to eat dessert for eternity. All because 
of the wideness of God's mercy, the depth of his love, all because of the grace of God. We're going to sing about that just now. We want you to, we want you to join us, please.